Good evening, everyone. I'm Richard Wendorf, the Stanford Calderwood Director and Librarian of the Boston Athenaeum, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you, you this evening. But tonight is something of a rain check. Or maybe it's a snow check. Snow check. <laughs> because it was exactly 12 months ago that uh, our speaker this evening, Lisa Jardine, was snowed out. She was supposed to give us a talk on her new book on Sir Christopher Wren, and she couldn't come up from New York, and had she been able to, we would not have been able to open our doors uh, so that you could listen to her. So uh, we were delighted uh, that she could uh, 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 make a book uh, foray uh, into New England again this year, and she has, in fact, produced another important book on another important 17th century English figure, and that reminds me to ask all of you, please, to turn <laughs> off your modern electronic devices. Uh, Professor Jardine has had, the, thank you. <laughs> Professor Jardine has had the kind of uh, academic career that most scholars can only dream about. She was the first woman to be elected a fellow of Jesus College, Cambridge. She then became reader in Renaissance history there. She is now professor of Renaissance studies at Queen Mary at the University of London, uh, where she is also director of the Center for Editing Lives and Letters, and she remains an honorary fellow of King's College, Cambridge. Uh, she uh, has published a number uh, of books, but I just want to uh, take a moment uh, to remind you that she writes frequently for uh, the English newspapers and journals and is often uh, interviewed and uh, quoted uh, on television. Uh, she has had the distinction of serving as the judge for three of the most prestigious uh, literary prizes in England, the uh, Whitbread Prize, the Orange Prize, and most recently, the Booker Prize. And her interest in uh, literary uh, literary affairs uh, is, is shown not only in her um, serving as a judge here, but also in her own book on Shakespeare, and uh, indeed in the lucid and very lively prose uh, that she writes in her own books. Those books include, uh, most recently, Worldly Goods, A New History of the Renaissance, a book I particularly admire with its emphasis on the triumph of the book in the 16th century and on the consumption of culture in early modern Europe. Uh, another recent book is Ingenious Pursuits, and then her biography of Sir Christopher Wren, which is titled On a Grander Scale. Professor Jardine is uh, part of that fine English tradition of scholars who produce uh, learned books, but do so with a broad audience in mind. She's interested not only in traditional history, but also in the history of art, and indeed in the history of science, which of course takes her to the curious life of Robert Hooke, which is the title of the book, copies of which she will sign later this evening, and the title of her talk as well. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lisa Jardine to the Boston Athenaeum. Thank you, Richard, for that lovely introduction. Am I turned on? Am I turned on? <laughs> Um, I'm, the, the, the problem about having a spot, which is because the lights are going to go down, is that I can't see the uh, gentleman who's going to tell me whether my mic is loud enough. But can you hear me at the back? You can. All right, fine. And, and um, if I could ask um, that very nice um, person with a red jacket on and dark hair, if she would raise her hand. That's you. You're turning around, but it's you. Um, uh, if, if I get too soft, will you just raise your hand? Right. It's, rare, it's unlikely to happen, but it might. Um, let me just start by saying that um, uh, that was not a trope for those of you who were booked for my talk um, here last year. Um, I really, really, really couldn't get in, and when I, um, when I suggested I might struggle here, was told that uh, there was snow heaped against the doors of the Athenaeum. It was not possible for me to be here. But that allows me to start by telling you um, the, the true story of why there is a book on Hook one year after uh, a biography of Wren, and it is as follows, that um, four years ago, I changed my publisher from Doubleday, uh, uh, in fact, the great imprint of Nantalees and Doubleday in New York, and I changed to um, HarperCollins, and I went, as one does with trepidation, to see my uh, new editor in London, Michael Fishwick, um, great history editor, and uh, he said, and what would you like to write a book about? And I said, well, I wrote this book 
called Ingenious Pursuits, which has done quite well. And it's about uh, the scientific revolution. And it's about the way that the scientific revolution was the, a consequence of teamwork, collaboration, uh, uh, interwoven webs of influence. Uh, I've written a book which is a, a sort of anti-genius book. It's about how um, science is, is done by teams. And in these teams, one figure has kept coming up over and over again. And that figure is a man called Robert Hooke. Never heard of him said uh, Michael Fishwick. I said, I'd really like to write a book about, Michael, about uh, Robert Hooke. He said, I'm sorry, general readership, nobody's heard of Robert Hooke. Well, tell me something about Robert Hooke that would make him interesting. And I said, well, for instance, he was Christopher Wren's closest friend. Ah, he said. Now, if you wanted to write a biography of Christopher Wren, <laughs> so this is a Leah and Rachel story, for those of you who know your Old Testament, which is I wrote 600 pages on Sir Christopher Wren. And then I went back and I said to Michael Fishwick, now can I write a book on, on Robert Hooke? And he said, very stern man he is, he said, well, yes, but you realize th this was in January 2002, the Wren biography came out in September 2002 in, in the UK. Um, January 2002, he said, well, yes, you can write a book on Robert Hooke. Now, you've persuaded me, um, but you do realize, and of course I realized, that 2003 was the 300th anniversary of Hooke's death. So he said, if you're going to write a book in the UK on Robert Hooke, it has to come out in 2003, which gave me exactly a year in which to write it, which is how come. So for those of you who, um, uh, who still mourn not hearing about Wren, um, you will, in fact, hear something about Wren. Uh, Hooke was his best friend. Um, and in fact, as I say at the beginning of my book on Hooke, it, this is a companion volume to the hook. The two stories are interwoven. I didn't do the story of the great architectural partnership again in the book on hook because I refer readers back. So that effect, if, if, effectively, this is a thousand pages on the intimate friendship and great careers of Wren and Hook. However, what this book is exercised about comes from that response of my editor in London. Who the hell is Robert Hook? Turns out, of course, you only, I mean, I know this from long experience, you only have to do a few NPR programs to discover that um, everybody knows about Robert Hook, at least who phones into a national public railway and is um, a railway, ra radio. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Nobody has a public radio or railway anymore. Um, uh, and um, and so, so, of course, not entirely unknown, but of course unknown beside those great figures in whose shadow he sits. Christopher Wren, and above all, Isaac Newton. So here we hope, we really, really, really hope, oh, yes, we did, okay. Two, in, two in, right. Here is Robert Hooke. Um, in question time, you may ask me how sure, I'm sure this is Robert Hooke, I'm sure this is Robert Hooke. Um, uh, the man who, all of whose portraits are supposed to have been destroyed by Isaac, New, Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was supposed to have destroyed all portraits of Hooke. I, as the daughter of a painter, know that nobody destroys portraits. They put them in closets and don't look at them, <laughs> right? And I found this in a closet, right, at the Natural History Museum where the collections of the Royal Society now are. And on the top right-hand corner, you may be able to see that it is labeled John Ray, I. Ray, which is why it was lost. It does not look even remotely like John Ray. John Ray, fortunately, when I first saw this, uh, flashed on the screen of a... Um, of a talk about something completely else, which had more to do with John Ray. I knew it wasn't John Ray, and I rushed off to look at it, and um, that the story began there. So this is Robert Hooke, a man who was born in 1635 on the Isle of Wight, born here on the Isle of Wight. This is Freshwater Bay on the Isle of Wight. The Isle of Wight, um, forgive me um, for patronizing the Boston Athenaeum, but it's a lozenge-shaped island which sits off the south coast, off Hampshire, off the south coast of uh, England, uh, somewhat as the island of Manhattan sits off the coast of the United States. Um, uh, and in a similar way in the 17th century, it uh, was a commercial center, um, was, a, was in fact the place where um, Charles I fled, first fled to um, between two revolutions, almost made his escape to France. Um, uh, Robert Hooks and his father um, certainly knew the king then. They were both, the family were great royalists. Um, all of his life, Hook was a royalist. So that's Freshwater Bay. 
This is the needles. Um, these are taken from the same sequence of, of uh, late 18th century um, engravings. The needles in the center there the, um, are so-called for the fact that they look like, they don't look like needles at all, but in the 17th century, here is a 17th century uh, watercolor by Lambert Duma, from, uh, a tourist from Holland. Um, and there you can see that the vertical spikes look more, a little bit more like needles. The one that looks most like a needle actually collapsed uh, during Hook's lifetime. On an island, an island fossil rich, um, an island on which he lived until he was 13. Um, and one of the things that I uh, suggest in his life is that um, that childhood marked him very deeply. He only actually, as far as we know, went back once in adult life, and that was for his mother's funeral. But when he did, he made the drawings on which this engraving is based. He, spent the, he was a man who could never not be busy. And so in the time he was on the island settling his mother's affairs, um, uh, actually at the height of the plague in, in early 1666, um, he, uh, he made drawings, he climbed the cliffs, he writes in his diary about um, making a scientific uh, inquiry on the Isle of Wight and there's a very strong sense in those later uh, comments that he makes that he, um, that he has a, a tremendous affinity and that affinity is also shown in drawings like this. This is a drawing that um, Hook made for the Royal Society. It's of a salt making, a saltern, what's called a saltern, S-A-L-T-E-R-N -E um, and this is actually a pen and ink drawing um, which he made again on that visit uh, back to the Isle of Wight when his mother had died, and he then presented it to the Royal Society. So um, he comes from a very naturally rich environment. He had an intellectual father. Um, at the age of 13, his father died. Um, I maintain that his father, in fact, committed suicide um, at, just as the king was taken from the island back to London, where, of course, the king was then executed. Uh, he sent his boy a week before his death to London with a an iron trunk uh, which was filled with his books, his, some of his father's books. And there um, the boy was first, according to him, his own record, apprenticed to Peter Lilly, later Sir Peter Lilly, the painter, because he had such a gift with, uh, for painting, uh, something which, of course, you can already see from these exquisite um, drawings which um, were later produced as engravings after his death. Um, there are wonderful drawings by Hook which, of course, brings him together with Wren. Both Wren and Hook um, uh, were exquisite line drawers. Uh -huh, maybe that was too much for the machine. No, there we go, there's the Sultan. Um, instead of, uh, uh, of continuing, he didn't um, embark on that apprenticeship. Um, he says because the smell of the paint gave him headaches. You know, those are the kind, I'm sure you all have stories about why you didn't become a concert pianist or... Um, uh, um, so, um, Hooks was that the smell of the paint gave him headaches. And he landed instead at the school, Westminster School, the great school of um, Busby. This is um, head teacher Busby in the big hat. Terrible. Um, it must be after a painting that no longer survives. But the reason I show this is for that... Um, rapt student look, watching the teacher. Um, and Busby was such, Busby became the father figure in Hook's life. Um, Busby in retirement um, remained, uh, he, he, Busby stayed the, the headmaster of Westminster until he was well past what we would now call retiring age, in fact until he was too infirm to continue. And when, in his, in his old age, and then when he retired to, to an estate he bought at Willen, uh, near where, what is now Milton Keynes, um, Hook remained his absolutely devoted, as it were, son. And um, uh, in fact, indeed, um, refurbished the church at Willen for him. And that church survives, you can go and visit it, although it has various Victorian modifications. So, in, so he, had, he received a great education at Westminster School. Wren was also at Westminster School. Um, the most remarkable thing about Richard Busby's time was that Busby was a royalist. Uh, the school is right under the nose of Parliament um, uh, in Westminster. But Busby took in and raised a number of fatherless royalist boys like Hook, um, who showed intellectual talent. And he managed to run the school as a royalist foundation throughout the entire 
um, Commonwealth period. And at the Restoration, he presided at the coronation, Headmaster Busby at the coronation of Charles II. I always digress, which means I never reach the end of my talk. Um, this is the other figure in um, uh, Hook's life who was an enormous influence. This is John Wilkins. Um, which says at the bottom, uh, secretary to the Royal Society, founder, in fact, of the Royal Society, first secretary, um, benefactor of Wadham. He was um, warden of Wadham College. Uh, the, he first took Wren under his wing. He's one of my personal heroes um, for the fact that he rescued both Wren and Hook. He was the man who had the idea of setting up the Royal Society. Um, I look at him um, and I sometimes ask myself how he was such a survivor he managed to preside at Wadham all the way through the uh, Commonwealth years and then to step neatly into a position under Charles II when the king returned, which was quite unusual to retain your posts under both, although he did have to resign from Wadham. And you know what? He's a very handsome man. Um, amongst these men, uh, he and Halley are the good lookers. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I have a nasty suspicion that that, is, I don't, that that persists through history. A man of charm, both Halley and, Wil and Wilkins, men of charm, men of ability, um, a man of the cloth, uh, um, Wilkins, um, w might otherwise have been called a trimmer. I don't know if you use the phrase in the United States. That is somebody who adeptly changes sides. To, um, uh, a trimmer. A, a trimmer is an 18th century word um, for a man who manages to uh, survive both Whig and Tory administrations. Um, and uh, so, but, but, it's a, but, it's a, but it's a nasty word. It's a word, you know, nobody wants to be called a trimmer. Um, but Wilkins managed to survive. And Wilkins' micrographia, which I will come to in a second, which is um, the source of Hook's enduring fame, in actual fact, um, is very much, is, is totally, it's dedicated to the king. Everything had to be dedicated to the king by, after 1660. Um, but it, is, it, it carries a devoted preface to John Wilkins. Um, and this is the third of his, um, you might say, father figures. This is Robert Boyle. Incidentally, incidentally, you see, I digress. This portrait of Wilkins is by Mary Beale, who is also the painter of that first portrait of Hook that I showed you. Um, uh, this is Boyle. It is not by Beale, but uh, in his diary, Hook tells us that in 1674, he went with um, Boyle, for Boyle to have his portrait painted by Mary, Mary Beale. That portrait hasn't shown up yet, though I believe ultimately it will. Um, and uh, uh, so that's another reason why I attribute that Beale portrait as being um, Hook, two of the, the, the great men in his life, another father figure. You, you'll hear, for those of you who are interested in amateur psychology, um, that I think it mattered a great deal to Hook that as the adored son and the, very, the youngest close son of a father who died unexpectedly, when he was um, at puberty, um, that he spends his life looking for father figures. And one of the reasons, uh, perhaps, that he is number two to so many number ones um, is that um, he, he has a tendency to become the devoted helpmate to men who um, seem to rise somewhat higher themselves. So his first job was, and I'll come back to this a little later, um, while, while he was still at Oxford, Robert Boyle, very well-to-do, youngest son of the Earl of Cork, um, arrived in Oxford and set up a laboratory, had become a great um, enthusiast for the new chemistry uh, and, in, and had also um, uh, designed but not successfully built uh, uh, what he called his evacuating engine, uh, the air pump, um, and uh, he took on Hook as his experimentalist um, as what he called his operator, the person who um, ran his experiments, uh, the, the young man, Hook, um, and Hook served as his operator until Boyle handed him on in 1662 to the Royal Society as their first operator. Hook, uh, Boyle was a founder member of the Royal Society, so he got his first job with Robert Boyle. No, no, Nobody is to get worried except me. <laughs> there we go. Um, and here, of course, is Wren. Um, and at Wren, uh, the, as I say, the friend from college. So these are the men um, who shadow, whose shadows fall across Robert Hook. There in the background is the completed St. Paul's. This is one of those wish fulfillment paintings. This is actually a posthumous portrait 
um, of Wren, and I suspect that that's his death mask at the centre because there's an identical portrait, the same face, that hangs at um, the Chelsea Royal Hospital. Um, and, of course, the, uh, he looks as if he, he sort of looks as if he's, in, what, in his 40s? Um, but, of course, the cathedral wasn't completed till he was in his late 80s. Um, and that is, indeed, the cathedral as completed, again, not as um, originally intended to be built. Now, I said to you that the first, um, the first great breakthrough, if you like, for Robert Hooke was a book that he published under the auspices of the Royal Society. It is, in fact, the second book published um, by the Royal Society, the first being um, John Evelyn's Silver of Trees, which is about, um, re re about it's, an, it's a very learned treatise on trees. The diarist John Evelyn was commissioned to write it because the deforestation of England had been so great and during the Commonwealth period, and it's about the kind of trees you should plant, first fast growers and slow growers and so on. The second book was Micrographia, or as this says, or some physiological descriptions of minute bodies made by magnifying glasses with observations and inquiries thereupon by R. Hook, Fellow of the Royal Society. He'd been a fellow since 1660. Four, I believe. Um, and down at the bottom, uh, printed, to the, printed by, John, by Martin and Alstree, printed to the Royal Society. It came out uh, in January 1665, and on the um, frontispiece is by the Council of the Royal Society of London for Improving in Natural Knowledge. This is the authorization. Uh, the Royal Society was authorized to print its own book. And there at the bottom is Branca. It says November the 23rd, 1664. That was when it was actually licensed, published in the following January. And Branca was the president, um, a notable courtier and, and actually something of a mathematician. Now, this book was an instant success. Um, uh, Pepys wrote in his diary that he rushed out and bought it. And then, because it's slightly, it's both a coffee, the coffee table book and a, a, a fairly good piece of marketing, um, the first plate is this um, uh, microscope made by Robert Reeves uh, and another device you don't need to know about for focusing um, light onto the microscope. But uh, Hook tells you very carefully exactly at what address you may purchase this and for exactly how much. And Pepe Stewley went out and bought one. Um, uh, and uh, he bought one, he looked down, it was deeply disappointed. I don't know how, I, how this is my professorial mode. How many people here have ever looked down the microscope? Oh, hooray! The first time you look, you see nothing. Is that not correct? It, it is actually... Oh, the gentleman here was fine the first time. <laughs> um, it, it's... Um, it's uh, uh, Peeps complains he couldn't see anything. So just like all of us setting up our computers, he had to get a house call from Reeves to teach him how to look through it. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, and what he showed, now it is impossible for us to understand the shock of these images. It's just impossible. We all know about microscopic magnification. This is the flea, the great plate out of micrographia. Now, if you'd had these things hopping around on you on a daily basis, as a, a good Londoner you would have done, um, and if you've ever, I hate to, nobody at the Athenaeum has ever had a flea on them. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, they are infuriatingly tiny, and this, in fact, is a wonderful plate that folds out from the um, folio book, the kind of, um, uh, well, you all know what a folio book is, a large book. Um, this folds out twice, so that it is actually 18 inches by 12 inches. Um, I tried to persuade my publisher to have it as a fold-out, uh, <laughs> but I am told that it puts the cost of a book up enormously to have a, you have to paste it in as a separate. A human being has to touch the book. Um, so instead of which, um, is that feedback? Are we getting harm or is that not me? If it's not me, I'm not worried. Um, uh, instead, we have it as a double page uh, spread. But it is impossible for us to grasp how shocking that image was, as were um, other, the other. This is um, a, a nettle. Now, I have to tell you that magnification of, like this uh, was not achieved until uh, well into the 19th century. 
Um, and it is still hard. Uh, Brian Ford is the, the, the person who's written as a microscopist about, about his um, ability, uh, the ability of these early microscopists. It is pretty remarkable, the magnification that they are getting. Um, one of the reasons that Hooke was so interested in this, in the stinging nettle, is because as a natural point, this is a perfect point on the barb of a stinging nettle, whereas he also magnifies the, the, the head of a pin, an artificial object made by man, which is shown to be bumpy and irregular and not at all as nature would have made it. This is um, his, his uh, engraving of Ketten or Kettering stone at the top there. Um, he, he probably made this uh, as part of the work he did with Wren. Uh, Ketten stone is one of Wren's favorite stones, and specifically because it doesn't fracture, it doesn't split. Um, and when Hooke looked at it under the microscope, um, it was made up of these curious um, uh, um, elements, uh, almost like tiny pebbles. Um, and that's why if you hit it hard, it doesn't break apart. It, it, t it takes the fracture through itself. Um, at the bottom here he, um, is, he, is gravel in his own urine. Which is of considerable interest that, um, because uh, all men of this period had um, uh, deposits in their urine from the, um, the, the iron-heavy... Um, wine that they drank, um, which was giving them gout, and gout, uh, uh, so this is the, he was actually looking at um, that one of the reasons for gout, and uh, again, some people, they see, and what I, you'll, you'll hear what I believe the profile of the Athenaeum is by the fact that fine French wines today are still um, casked in iron-rich barrels, which is why only people who drink very fine French wine still get gout. <laughs> I'm showing you these so that you can sort of get the idea of this as, um, th this is my favorite, um, which is the seeds of the thyme plant. And Hook writes that it looks exactly like a dish of lemons, as indeed it does. Um, I, I want to show you them as, as shocking, but I also want you to see um, how, that they are an important part of, um, of, of the biological sciences, and I do believe that had, I, one of the reasons I think my NPR callers um, were telling me that they all remembered um, uh, learning about the microscope and learning that Hooke had done wonderful things in micrographia is because biology has come back in fashion since the genome, the human genome project, and since the uh, discovery of DNA. Um, Hooke was lost from sight most totally um, in the post-World War II period, when, of course, the mathematical and physical sciences, as well introduced by Sir Isaac Newton, who therefore becomes the great hero, um, utterly eclipsed the biological sciences. Um, I, think that, I think it is beyond doubt that Hooke is a founding father of the biological sciences, um, uh, and therefore not lost. This is the slide of, his, um, uh, of a slice through the bark of a cork tree, and it is on the basis of this slide that he coined the word cell, C-E-L-L, -L, for the tiny apertures, air-filled apertures in the cork, not strictly, and then that was taken over into biology for the, as it were, atomic particle size of a, a, in biology, although it, it would have to be said that the hook isn't using it of quite such a small element. Um, he had been sent this by Anton von Leeuwenhoek um, in Delft, or rather the Royal Society had, um, who sent a lot of prepared slides to the Royal Society, which Hook also looked at. So we have this great book, and we have, in 1665, we have um, Hook as beginning to make a major reputation on the continent as well as in England with the Royal Society. And at this point, he is professor at Gresham College in London, and um, forgive me that I didn't bring a pointer, but where the nine is on the, can you see the nine on the windows? That was Hook's rooms at Gresham College. And the, you see the wooden um, uh, uh, railings around the roof of a little tower. Um, that was where Hook set up his telescopes. Um, and he lived in that accommodation um, from 1664 when he got his professorship 
um, until he died in 1703. He died there in 1703. He lived his entire life in those rooms in Gresham College. But at this point in his life, September the 2nd, 1666, London is destroyed in the Great Fire. Um, and um, uh, it's hard not to sound cheap by saying that that event was as traumatic for London in 1666, I, I believe, as 9-11 was for New York. That is, it was the heart of the city. Um, great landmark buildings were destroyed. And above all, as you can see all too clearly in this painting, old St. Paul's, which had not had its spire since the 1560s, but was nevertheless the great landmark. And you see the great um, slab of old St. Paul's burning in the middle of this painting. And indeed, because this painting, like all paintings of the fire, is an imagined reconstruction, all the paintings put old St. Paul's at the center. And therefore, they resemble um, those incredible uh, photographs um, syndicated photographs of the Dome of St. Paul's, of New St. Paul's, rising above the devastation of the Blitz uh, in World War II. And it is true that um, it was because Winston Churchill knew his history so well, knew that St. Paul's was absolutely the heart of London, that he did um, instruct the firefighters. Um, I'm actually reading a wonderful new book uh, called St. Paul's 604 to 2004, um, which is about to come out with Yale University Press, uh, and the chapter about the centrality of St. Paul's. Winston Churchill knew how, how, how central it was, and he instructed the firefighters to be taken off all the surrounding buildings and to play their hoses on St. Paul's all through the worst nights of the Blitz, which is why the cathedral survived. It also meant that all sorts of wonderful buildings, like the Wren Chapter House, um, were burnt to the ground. But Churchill knew that this had to survive. So this is what happens to Hook. Now... It's more than his being in the city of London when, um, uh, when it goes up in flames. It, up, up, thank you. <laughs> now, if you'd said up, <laughs> thank you. Um, you mean I was pointing it straight at you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which was just as well I wasn't holding the laser print pointer in my other hand. Um, this is Wenceslas Holler's um, engraving of the destruction of the, of the, the fire. And do you, I hope you see what I mean about, I mean, it's the heart of London. No wonder that Londoners believed, uh, with some, I mean, there was some good reason for them to believe that the Dutch, with whom they were at war, had sent terrorists in and fired the city. That was what was believed for weeks after the fire. Not that it had been um, uh, an oven badly put out um, in, in uh, Pudding Lane, if indeed that was the cause. Um, and foreigners were... Um, were beaten up in the street, streets of London in the, follow, in the days following the fire and accused of um, having set the fire. So this is the, the heart of London. But what I want uh, you to notice, how can I give you your bearings? You can see four pocket handkerchiefs. So it looks like a, a flag. If you look down from that flag, you should see the letter T um, around a courtyard. That is Gresham College. I'm pointing it up. <laughs> Oops, I did it too. Um, this is an enlargement of that. Um, uh, that is Gresham College. The fire, the wind dropped. The fire stopped 50 yards from Gresham College. That was why I stressed to you that it was Hook's only home, uh, that it was also the home of the Royal Society, that it housed all their scientific instruments, that it housed all the Royal Society papers, it housed all Hook's papers, um, and unlike Pepys, who was wealthy enough to take a barge and carry his uh, books down to Deptford when, as the fire spread, um, Hook had not moved anything. The Royal Society had not moved anything. H Hook regarded it as providential that the fire had stopped at his door, and it was providential twice over. Not only was he saved um, from losing all his worldly goods in that fire, but the Corporation of London, that is the aldermen of London who ran the city and who were responsible for dealing with the consequences of the fire, moved in next day, all of them, into Gresham College. They evicted the professors. In fact, they broke down the door of one professor, one professor who wasn't prepared to go. They broke down his door and removed him by force. 
So they requisitioned, the city requisitioned Gresham College. Hook, however, had nowhere else to go. He literally had no kin, remember, he's an orphan boy. He was allowed to remain. And as a result, in the three weeks following the fire of London, it was he who was cheek by jowl with the organizing committee. He had no position at all. He was a well-known man about town. He was well-known for talking in the coffee houses about science. He kept good company. He and Wren often dined together in, in uh, prominent uh, taverns uh, in and around um, the city. Um, indeed, Throckmorton Street, which of course was the, um, the financial center. I didn't mention that. The entire financial cent center was burnt out, and with it, most of the paper money. Um, I mean, it was a, it was a disaster. Um, it w uh, so, um, and Hook became indispensable to the corporation. He was a man who was already famous for his um, scrupulousness with figures, his ability to measure, his ability to calculate, his deftness with his hands. And within a month, the city had made him their city surveyor. And he became the man who measured the city of London. And I mean measured with posts and string and rope. Um, uh, he, and, he was supposed to have a team of three. It was supposed to be um, Oliver, uh, Hook, and the third man whose name I have temporarily forgotten. Um, but it ended up being almost entirely Hook. I haven't yet told you that he was a workaholic and an insomniac, but you probably had got that part of the message by now. This is just to sort of make that point. Um, uh, all, the reason we know how much he did, the reason we know that at the same time that he was doing an experiment a day for the Royal Society, which had had to move out of Gresham College uh, and had been ho given the home on the strand of Lord Arundel, who was a, a great supporter um, and who eventually gave his library to the Royal Society, they'd moved down to the strand, which was actually inconvenient for Hook. Hook had usually, his experiment a day could be done in the house. He now had to trundle his experiments on a handcart down to the Strand through the devastated city. He still had to produce an experiment a day for the Royal Society. But he was also, each of these lines is payment, paying out from the coffers of the, uh, the corporation um, for the laying out of foundations. And most of them say Robert Hooke against them. You won't be able to read that very clearly. All of those records are still in the corporation archives housed at the Guildhall in London. And a wonderful man called Michael Cooper has actually worked, uh, who's a, himself a retired surveyor, has worked through all of those papers, or certainly the major part of them. And on the basis of that, he's A, written a very lovely little book called To Beautify the City, which came out last year in 2003, which is all about explicitly, exclusively about Hook's surveying activities. But he's also... Michael Cooper has redone all the calculations. Um, you have to be a retired surveyor, don't you? <laughs> um, and remember, Hook did not have a pocket calculator. Um, in the margin, this is a, um, a, a document signed by Robert Hook, to, which starts out, um, this, the, these are to certify that I have ad measured the ground taken off from the foundation belonging to Mr. King. So um, he had requisitioned a certain amount of land to widen a street. Um, London had, the Corporation of London had decided to put uh, London back to how it was before the fire, largely so as not to appear totalitarian, not to appear autocratic, because to have swept away the city and put in, as Wren wanted, a great new um, Paris-style city um, would have meant... Um, uh, exiling the citizens of London to the suburbs and would have smacked of, as I say, um, uh, a tyrant, would have smacked of tyranny. Um, the king had only been back six years and therefore it was decided that every householder would have back his plot of land, but that the roads would be widened um, and building regulations would be introduced. Building regulations written by Hook and Wren um, uh, would be introduced. So a bit of land has been taken away um, and down the margin, Hook has calculated exactly how much has been taken and exactly, therefore, how much compensation should be paid. And down at the bottom is, is um, scribbled the sum of money that the clerk paid out to the householder who had lost that land. Now, so the other thing that, my, that Michael Cooper has calculated is that um, Hook was that rare thing in Restoration London, an honest man. He never took a halfpenny uh, for himself. And, he, and every calculation was carried out 
um, exactly, precisely, and everyone got exactly what they were owed. And I have to say to you that in these, um, this, our era of Enron, and so have you, um, I think that that has a huge amount to do with the confidence of the citizens of London in the rebuilding of the city. It happens that Wren and Hooke were both truly honest men. Wren used to complain that he had not become rich like his friends, Sir, Steve, Sir Stephen Fox, who'd risen from being a stable boy to being a multimillionaire um, as the chief financier of the king, uh, or any number of other men of the period who had uh, managed, Peeps indeed, became rather wealthy. Um, uh, through little backhanders or deals or side, uh, side deals um, uh, or whatever. Um, but Hook and, neither Hook nor Wren did any such thing. Uh, so here we have Hook, the scrupulous, not just curious, but scrupulous. And here I'm very fond of this because this is Hook and Oliver. They also had to arbitrate in all cases where something had changed about the relationship between properties and therefore two householders might be at odds about what the outcome should be. This is a particularly nice one because it is um, an arbitration over the following. In medieval London, houses could run over each other. Actually, um, uh, country cottages in England still sometimes do this. So you'll have one cottage, you have two front doors, and then one cottage will go up and over the other cottage. Um, so that you don't have a vertical partition between two properties. Now, one of the regulations in the new regulations, of course, fire spread, was a, it, that was a, turned out to be a huge fire trap. Um, uh, so one of the new building regs was that um, every house had to be, if you had a party wall, if you were two owners of one property, it must run vertical, it must be a certain density of brick, it must be a certain strength, all of that was laid down. And this is a lovely um, arbitration between two uh, property owners um, who are now have to have a vertical wall between their properties deciding who gets how much of the resulting property. I'm trying not to go on too long, but I'm up, thank you. Um, it was as a result of the fire that, Wren's great, that Hook's greatest partnership with Wren began. I sort of, the reason I'm telling this actually as a biographical story is because what I want you to hear is the happenstance of a life of someone as busy as Hook. So not only does he lay out London, in other words, how could he get to be as great as Isaac Newton, um, a, a dysfunctional, um, uh, reclusive, mathematician in his own rooms in Trinity College, Cambridge, um, a, 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 a monotasker, um, where uh, Hook is an absurd multitasker. Um, uh, now, I'm not exonerating Hook. I'm not saying, you know, that I'm letting him off the hook about the hook, letting him off the hook about this. Um, but I do think that it goes a long way to explain. Uh, but the events um, add to uh, the nature of the complexity of his life. So uh, he has already been doing astronomy with Wren. He's already been doing uh, anatomical experiments with Wren. He and Wren, remember, have known each other since college, um, and they are uh, great practicing scientists. Um, Wren, at, on the same time that Hooke is made city surveyor, Wren is made royal surveyor. Two clients in London, the Corporation of London and the King. My husband is an architect. The biggest nightmare you can have is two clients. Indeed, Ground Zero has two clients. It's not that, you know, the, the cities tend to have more than one client. The, the, ma the, the, person, the benefactor, in this case the King, um, and the corporation or the city. The, um, uh, and... Um, uh, and again, it was one of the miracles for another of the serendipities, like the saving of um, Gresham College, that Wren and Hooke were already friends. That was not part of the plan. I don't believe anybody knew that. The Royal Society instantly recognized that this was going to be valuable for the rebuilding of London. And sure enough, 1670, um, when the Act for Rebuilding the City Churches is um, passed, and uh, it's agreed that coal tax, to the tune of however many pence in the shilling, uh, will uh, go to rebuild all the churches destroyed in the fire. Um, Hook and Wren together are appointed to the rebuilding. Hook becomes Wren's site architect. That is his partner, his architectural partner, but above all, his site architect. Um, again, remember I'm married to an architect. Architects only do site visits for very important clients. Norman Foster does not go to every building. Um, he goes to the particular, because you can't. There are too many buildings on site. Um, uh, Wren went to St. Mary Le Beau when it was on site. He went to, to uh, St. Lawrence Jury when it was on site because they had important benefactors. He went to 
St. Paul's, of course, um, but very often it was Hook who, went on, who was on site and therefore had a major part in the kind of redesign that inevitably goes on when a building is on site. So the two of them go into partnership, and of course this is um, the fruit of their partnership. If I had got here through the snow last year in the other talk, the reason I've used this particular slide, which shows in a way that the Dome of St. Paul's is a monstrosity, is, is wildly out of proportion um, as a dome thrown above a, a, a cathedral, but is thrown that high with an 850-ton stone lantern on the top because the corporation wanted a spire. One client wanted a spire, and the king wanted a dome, and Wren wanted a dome, and it does stand high enough still above the... I mean, it is still visible from all over London. The man who made it possible to raise that high a dome, uh, the man who had the structural engineering skills, uh, was Hook. And what he designed for the cathedral is that masonry cone, that curious shape between the two... Um, this is an illusionary dome. When you stand inside St. Paul's, you look up at what looks like the roof, but you're not. You're seeing um, a true dome um, with a, an oculus at the center, an open hole. You look up and you think you can see the sky, uh, but in fact, um, the sky is nowhere near. Um, there, are, there is this, um, uh, I have to say, catenary in this country, what I would say catenary-shaped st uh, masonry cone, um, which hook had done the mathematics for, although he couldn't do the equation, like he couldn't do the equation for the ellipse, um, for the inverse square law. But he did know that the most structurally secure um, uh, form, supporting form, um, for the 850-ton lantern uh, was a catenary-shaped, an, in, an inverted hanging chain. A hanging chain is a catenary. You throw it up um, and rotate it, and you get a form uh, the Arch at St. Louis is a catenary, an inverted catenary, I have to keep saying. Right? Um, uh, that is not actually, uh, that it, it should be slightly more belled, and I've lain on it, and it's belled. I don't, I'm nothing if not practical with these things. I've been up there, and it isn't a flat cone, it's a belled cone. Uh, that was Hook who designed that. Can't do you the whole story of that, it's a wonderful story. But this is certainly Hook. This is the monument to the Great Fire, 200 and something height. Just have to see where I am in my slides, if you'll just let, forgive me for a minute, because um, I don't want to keep you, to keep you here till it snows again. No, we're fine. <laughs> Which I think is Thursday. <laughs> um, this is the monument to the Great Fire. Um, and again, um, uh, in the course of my um, research on, for, for the book on Wren, um, I, I I, when I visited it, um, and I discovered that not only is it Hook's design, this is a drawing by Hook, signed off by Wren on the left-hand side. Um, those illusionary flames are because um, uh, the king was going to uh, celebrate, or the, the, on the anniversary of the Great Fire, they were going to put flambeau in those slits, and they were going to hinge back the lid um, and fire rockets out of the top. <laughs> and there is indeed a lid. This is a drawing my husband made when I got overexcited about discovering the laboratory at the bottom of, um, which is entirely Hook's work. Uh, there's no plans for it. There's no, uh, there's no, uh, nobody remembered it. Hawksmoor in, in 1728 had already forgotten about it and just thought this was a column. But there is in fact um, uh, a laboratory in the basement of the monument and you can take out every bit of hardboard that's been put in to stop children spitting from the top, apparently. Um, uh, you can, and and uh, I have been up that ship's ladder, the vertical ladder um, that rises from way above where the public is allowed up onto the gallery. Um, it's, it's exactly like a sort of Hans Christian Andersen story. It's like Bluebeard. And you go to the top and you climb to the top and you hit what you think is a ceiling. And then I saw there was a... Uh, I could see daylight, and when I pushed, these two doors opened, and I found myself right above the street, and my husband in the basement could see the sky. And this was a, a, a zenith telescope designed by, um, by Hook and used for uh, a long while after it was constructed. This we know to be Hook's, and it is my emblem of bringing science, the science and the um, architecture together. I'm rem that, that is reminding you that the architecture and the science go hand in here, hand. And here is Boyle and his air pump. And here is the air pump again. 
to remind you that at the very same time that Hook is doing all of this, he is the only man who can make this air pump work. I actually have to um, perform with a replica of this at the Royal Institution of, uh, in London uh, next Friday where I'm doing a Royal Institution discourse. Um, and I already know that I can't get it to work, so I won't try. I mean, it's a perfect replica. But the skill you need as an experimentalist um, to manage to get anything close to a vacuum inside that um, uh, chamber at the top into which you will have put some small unsuspecting animal um, which you will um, quietly kill by... Uh, because the, it's, the experiments were largely about respiration. So um, you would put a mouse or a canary in there and then watch the way when, as you extracted the air, the bird succumbed. Um, and if you were lucky, you could bring it back to life by letting some air back. And if you, I mean, the bird was, if the bird was lucky, you could bring it back. And if they, um, you weren't, they didn't. Um, but, of course, this is also the piece of experimental equipment uh, which produced Hooke's law, uh, Boyle's law, excuse me, should be Hooke's law. Uh, pressure times volume is a constant. PV is a constant uh, for gases. And that was done in this chamber. Um, so we have Hooke doing this at the very same time. I'm not pointing in the right direction, clearly. Um, also working with Wilkins, and I'm here just re recapitulating that this is also teamwork. Evelyn went to Durden's. I told uh, they went outside at the Great Fire, um, sorry, the plague preceding the Great Fire. Um, the Royal Society decamped to Durden's in Epsom. This is Durden's in Epsom, where they did a lot of experiments. Uh, Wilkins, Petty, and Hook doing those experiments. So you have a man who is not only involved on his own behalf, but involved constantly in science on behalf of others as part of a team. Um, and this is um, uh, a homage both to Hook and to Wilkins. This is the universal joint at the top. Um, if we have any engineers or motor mechanics or uh, uh, automobile mechanics here, the universal joint which still drives the drive shaft on a, uh, on a car is Hooke's invention and is, I gather, um, sometimes known as Hooke's universal joint. So you begin to see that what is it that makes a man a great man like Sir Isaac Newton? Hooke's name does crop up for great. Without the universal joint, um, that is to say a joint which allows you to um, move, can you see two um, hinge struts? <coughs> in fully in three dimensions. Um, most of modern um, uh, technology wouldn't work. But, and below it, uh, very poignantly, in Wilkins's universal character, thus in code and in the universal language that his hero John Wilkins had developed, devised, which never worked as a universal language, did work as a good code, because you could never read it back, um, <laughs> is... Um, uh, uh, is Hooke's um, account of how he will build a balance spring watch, which will um, enable you to calculate longitude at sea. Um, uh, I offered a magnum of champagne to anybody who could translate it in ingenious pursuits. Nobody claimed the magnum. Somebody claimed that there was an article written in 1910, I think, uh, where um, a very distinguished uh, scientist claimed to have translated it, but I then discovered that he'd just copied the English version, of, of, uh, because there is an English version. So th I don't believe you can read this back, but if anyone wants to disprove me, please do. So I'm trying to give you a flavor of the man in the fullness of his life, and then what do we run up against? You know who that is. You didn't know who the first person was. Somebody has to tell me who that is. It's Newton. I picked the sort of nastiest picture I could find. <laughs> I mean, it's a beautiful painting, but this is Hook as a grumpy old man. Um, and I, I, I wanted to get that accelerated pace of Hook's life, everything going pretty right for him, except that unfortunately he was also experimenting uh, medically on himself with various new um, metals and chemical medicines, for all of the, the vogue. Um, all of which were purgatives, all of which were toxins, and therefore um, was quietly poisoning himself. But, um, but um, uh, he fell out with Newton. He fell out with Newton actually very early in his life. Oh, gone too far. He fell out very early in his, li in, uh, his life when Newton, who was still young and reclusive at Trinity, sent the Royal Society this drawing of a, reflection, a reflective telescope, that is a telescope 
with, um, with mirrors inside, so that instead of having to have these hopelessly long telescopes um, that were so unwieldy, you could virtually have a pocket telescope, he sent with it um, a draft of an article about color um, and the nature of light. Newton sent this to the Royal Society. The Royal Society jumped at the telescope, which they immediately uh, patented and were very excited about. They passed the essay on color to Hooke, who said two things about it. One, he said it was wrong in parts, which it was. Um, and two, he said it was largely cribbed from a treatment of thin color films and the nature of light in micrographia. Remember micrographia? It doesn't only have stuff about uh, microscopy. It also has the um, texts of some experiments that Hooke had done at the Royal Society. Now, as with so many stories, Hooke, Hooke wrote to Newton, telling him so. Newton, Hooke was the older man. Hooke was the senior man. Newton took absolute umbrage um, in the way that a very nervous, difficult, um, reclusive man might and refused to have anything more to do with the Royal Society for about 10 years. The interesting thing is that uh, Newton's copy of Micrographia survives in Trinity College Library, and the section on light and color is indeed very heavily annotated. You know, there's always two sides to these stories. Um, so the first quarrel with Newton, the second quarrel was over this, up at the top is the balance spring um, uh, mechanism. This is, this is, is from Hooke's um, uh, treatise of spring, uh, which on the basis of which this is the, the, the spring in the middle is his experimental equipment uh, on the basis of which he discovered Hooke's law, that is that um, extension equals, tension equals lambda times extension, which tells you that the more you stretch a spring, the more it it, the, the harder it works to, go, to return to its original state, and that can be harnessed um, to produce an isochronous me mechanism for a watch. Uh, Hooke develops this very early, but unfortunately, someone at the Royal Society passes the information to Christian Huygens, um, the spoilt son of this man. Sir Constantine Huygens, the secretary to um, successive Princes of Orange in the Low Countries, and Mr. Huygens publishes his watch in the proceeding. This is actually copied back. This is the, the, the image out of the Journal des Savants in Paris, where it was first published, which uh, has been reprinted back in the philosophical translations. That's why it's in, it's in English. Um, but again, so now there's a great quarrel between Huygens, who is extremely influential, whose father is extremely important, um, and poor Hook, who thinks with some reason um, that his watch, which was going to be his great discovery, not only do you need a small, a pendulum clock will not do, um, as, uh, for instance, uh, if you want to do precision astronomy. Because you look through your microscope, you take a measurement, if you have to walk over to a wall clock, You've lost, uh, you, what you actually have to do if you use war clocks, and they did it at Greenwich Observatory, is count as you walk to the clock, count seconds, um, and then take the time and count seconds back. But if you have a handheld watch, you can stand by the telescope with your watch, and that was one of the reasons. But the other, um, they already knew that if they could use a, uh, a, a watch that kept good time um, at sea uh, with a telescope, they would be able to um, solve the longitude problem, which was not solved until, as you all know, because of David Sobel, John Harrison did a century later. Right. Here is the man doing all of this. I'm telling you that he, his reputation is sullied by these quarrels, and yet they're quarrels in which we tend only listen, to listen to one of the quarrelese parts. Of course I'm partisan. Of course I, you know, I'm actually debating with James Glick at the Hay Festival. Um, he'll do Newton and I'll do Hook. Um, and um, uh, so um, I, this is the diary. How can I capture all that he's doing? I bet you've already forgotten that at the same time he's doing all of this, he's also measuring London and designing churches and um, uh, going to coffee houses and um, uh, taking actually quite long um, horseback journeys to look at properties that he's dealing with outside London. This is his diary for the 1670s. 
and an even better one. This is a double page of his diary. Can you see I picked this because this has got the spring experiments um, uh, in the margin. I mean, this is the kind, the, the, it's almost, it's not in code like Pepys' diary, and we don't have it, well, actually, we only have, I, it wasn't until I read Claire Tomlin's wonderful book that I sort of somehow re re remembered that Pepys' diary is only 10 years. Um, I have at least 10 years of Hooke's diary. Uh, in fact, somewhat more, because we have the diary for the 16, uh, seven, all through the 1670s, which is his prime. And this is when he's doing all these things at once. And this is the best way I can represent it. Not in code, but cryptic, to the point that it's often very difficult to separate the activities and to know exactly what he means. So it's really quite hard. Uh, you can't just read it and decide what he's doing. This is actually the late diary um, from the 1680s. It's another run of diaries we have when he's doing it slightly differently. Um, but, he, but this is it's on the basis of these somewhat obsessive records that he keeps. He says somewhere to Aubrey um, that he didn't have a very good memory, and that's why he wrote everything down. Um, I think if I did as many things in a day as he did, I wouldn't remember them very well either. So that's the man, the busy man, and here are some of his medicines. Actually, it's not, but this is a draw from the Bigani cabinet uh, at Queen's College, Cambridge, um, and it is a collection of contemporary medicines, and they are all absolutely awful substance, substances you should never let cross your lips, let alone take them as Hook does on a daily basis, and he records in his diary uh, that he does. Um, I argue in the book, and I am um, pretty sure, that he was what we would call a drug addict. Um, he, he's, he's dependent. I mean, what happens is you take these things, they produce symptoms, you take more to control the symptoms. If you stop taking them, you get worse symptoms. Um, and so uh, he certainly, having been a very congenial young man, a much-loved young man, a rather good-looking, though, with a, as we all know, with a curved back, um, but dressed well, um, uh, liked his appearance, um, uh, liked company, was quite the opposite of, of Newton, but by his 60s, when his friend Richard Waller knew him and wrote a, a very damaging description of what he looked like, um, he was a wreck. He was a physical wreck um, and uh, emaciated. He didn't eat much. Um, uh, what he did eat, he threw up. Um, and um, bad-tempered, um, suspicious, disappointed, and I just use this to sum that up at the end of this very full life. Um, however, he was still going about his business. I don't like the idea that he just keeled over. You know, I don't, it's, that, isn't that a kind of um, Byron-esque story about how he just became sicker and sicker and more and more hated and a miser and retreated to his rooms. I put this in because you will see the date 1699 down the bottom there. This is him still collecting his salary from Gresham College um, right up to at least, this is the last one I think we have, 1699. He died in 1703. Now that leaves you a few more years, but he certainly had a full and active life up, um, I think, till 1700. Um, he died in March, on the 2nd, 3rd March, the night of the 2nd to the 3rd of March, 1703. And this is his will. He wrote it, as you can see there, um, on the 25th day of February. And he didn't finish it, and he didn't sign it, because um, I find this very poignant. Um, I actually found this will in the public record office. Never believe a document is lost. You know, that's my mantra. Um, actually, that is a total fib. My long-suffering daughter, Rachel, found it, who I had sent to look for at another document, um, but she's well-trained by me, and once she pulled down the, the folder of documents, she looked through the folder, and three documents away from the document we were looking at, which was the, um, the inventory of effects, um, was this unsigned will, which nobody had seen before. So this, that's why I, I, I suppose I love it, because I love my daughter Rachel, and I love the fact you can still find documents um, 300 years after they were lost. Um, uh, but I show it to you because it's, this sums up for me the state he had been reduced to. Um, halfway down you read, I do, be I do bequeath and give to my good friends A, B, C, and D, my whole estate. He couldn't decide. Which four friends? Did he have four friends? Um, and it, it breaks off. You see lower down again before the four said 
A, B, C, and D. He didn't sign it. He died before he could sign it. And actually, that's the, really the tragedy of Hook, because within a week of his death, um, his, his, his good friend, Robert Knox, the sea captain Robert Knox, did in fact, was called by his maid as he was dying, ran to his house. He was already dead. He did seal up the house. He did lay out the body with Henry Hunt, the, the curator of the um, repository at, at Gresham, um, but he wasn't able to prevent the dispersal of all his goods and effects because if you die with no living relatives, that's what happens. Um, and so part of the loss of the reputation of Hook is the dispersal at his death of everything he'd so carefully assembled. Unlike Wren, who had a son to follow after him, unlike Newton, who was already so famous by the time he died that anything he had touched um, had tremendous importance. Uh, but I hope that I've persuaded you that Robert Hook is a man worth remembering. Thank you. I did run over, so if anybody has to run out, um, please do, but I would love to take questions if anybody has any. One here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was he a family man? See, all the things I had to leave out. Um, uh, Hook did not marry. Um, he, he, as I say, he was very gregarious. Um, neither was he of a different sexual preference, and I will insist on immediately. Um, I mean, men who came out of the Commonwealth years, who had lost their um, inheritance and lost, you know, who were basically struggling to survive. Many of them didn't marry. They did form very close friendships with other men of the kind that uh, Hook formed with Wren. And there are a number of them. I, wanted, I once wanted to write a book about um, these pairs of men at the Restoration, uh, mostly men who had lost their fathers and who become these, they're sort of like, well, no, Boston Narratives has the wrong association, but, it, you know, they, they, they were, um, they, they were companions. They were, they were companions. Um, he, he, in, he did take into his house the 12-year-old daughter, this is the salacious bit, the 12-year-old daughter of his older brother John from the Isle of Wight. Um, at the, when he was at the height of his own um, fame, um, because he negotiated a marriage for her, a very profitable marriage, uh, when she would be old enough, to Thomas Bloodworth's son, Thomas Bloodworth, who was the mayor of London, who looked out of the great fire and said, why did you wake me up? Uh, a maid could piss it out. You know, everybody remembers that about Thomas Bloodworth. Anyway, he remained an important alderman, um, and there was a betrothal, um, but it didn't come off. It fell through. It may have been because John Hook was so bad with money that he couldn't come up with the dowry. Um, so Hook had a grace in London from 12 to 14 and a maid living, you know, a, a chaperone. Um, uh, she, well, she had French lessons. She was educated. He bought clothes for her. He's, um, he, he spent a lot of money, 40 shillings on one occasion on a dress for her. That's a lot, a lot of money, and, you know, for a man who didn't like spend money easily. Um, uh, but it fell through, and he sent her back to the Isle of Wight, where she arrived... Um, and was promptly seduced by Sir Robert Holmes, who was the governor of the Isle of Wight, who some of you may remember as the man who, may, who was thought to have caused the Great Fire of London because he set fire to the Dutch fleet off um, The Hague in August 1666. It was because of that atrocity, really, um, that the, um, many people believed the Dutch had come and reaped their vengeance by setting fire to London. Uh, she was seduced by Sir Robert Holmes and had a daughter, Mary, by him. So she was ruined. He didn't marry her. He did adopt the daughter. And uh, Grace returned. And some people say that the baby might have been Hook's. Tosh. Nonsense. Nonsense. <laughs> she came back to London and she became Hook's housekeeper. So she's now a ruined girl. And Hook must have believed that she would look after him for the rest of his life. And he did commence some kind of sexual relationship with her, um, as he had had with a number of his previous maids. I always say it's the misfortune of keeping a scrupulous diary. I mean, I think that's what most bachelor men did. Um, uh, but uh, Hook wrote it down. Um, 
however, he wrote it down in a very particular way and call me a pedant. You know, remember, I am an archival scholar. He always writes, played with grace, you know, romped with grace. Full stop. Paisky's sign, which is orgasm, right? Just as, they, you know, just as Pete said. Now, I trust that full stop. <laughs> Um, I, I don't think it was, I don't believe he, that, that, that that was a possibility. I don't mean that he was, you know, he had, was a man of integrity. I just think it was out of the question um, that he went back to his own bedroom before he um, completed the act. I'm not going to go any further than that. Um, uh, um, in 1687, Grace Hook died. 87, 1687. She died after a very short illness, might have been typhoid. And uh, Waller says that Hook never recovered. Um, you can see, I mean, I don't think that was love. I'm sorry, you know. I, don't, I think it was that, she, that he had a household. He had a household that was supposed to last till his own death. Um, and he was never the same again after that. So that was his family life. Thank you for asking that. Another question. I don't always give such long answers. Yes. Mm hmm Yes. Well, I, that, yeah, exactly. I don't think uh, um, the drawing of snowflakes. One of the reasons I don't show those plates is they are not the, the precision plates that these are. The reason I can see it in my mind's eye is that Royal Society Christmas card last year was that plate, um, uh, of, uh, was that image, and it's lovely, you know. It, um, but it is only a line drawing, um, and it way, may well be that it's taken from somewhere else. And if so, um, Hook probably says so in the, um, in the text. But of course, you only need a magnifying glass to look at a snowflake. Um, I mean, it isn't a big deal to magnify a snowflake. Um, and, you know, most elementary school children, you know, preschool children um, discover the star in the snowflake. So um, the word plagiarism, but you know, people have got this, that's the problem. It's not that I make, I'm trying to make him into a, a what, a, um, a Mr. Darcy, you know. Um, I, it's just that, it's just that um, things like he plagiarized it, you know, this is a very contentious period, the period in which they live. Um, I don't believe anyone at the time said he plagiarized it, but people use, they take that kind of tone of voice and turn of phrase with Hook, and I'm kind of trying to defend him from that, which is partly why I use that portrait, um, which I do truly believe to be Hook, but I'm fed up with people um, reconstructing hideous, go on, believe me, go Google Hook in Google Images, and you'll find these hideous imagined images, you know, Richard III, you know. Um, in fact, it's not just Richard III, it's what was finding, um, looking for Richard, what was um, that wonderful actor. Uh, anyway, it's the kind of, mm, no, he, I don't think he looked like that. Yes, at the back. Sorry, could you say that again? Yes. Now, people keep asking me about Hook and evolution, and I have to say that um, if to say, as Hook says, Diane Rehm asked me about Hook and evolution on live radio, <laughs> and I didn't know the answer, but I busked. Um, uh, um, if what Hook says is that when you look at these minute animals, they perfectly resemble large ones, and that therefore he believes there's a scale of nature, which is kind of in the right track. I would be a little more confident about that. Um, and yes, so yes, this um, uh, micrographia does contain new information um, which, um, which could have given people ideas about on the track to evolution. But at around, almost at the same time that Hooke was writing, a man called Tyson, T-Y-S-O-N, uh, published a book about orangutans, um, which is much clearer about the resemblance between apes and human beings. 
So I'm a little bit, um, I think it's sort of there as a possibility, and he does say something, and <coughs> some textbooks do suggest that Hooke was an early proponent, but that's a little bit like saying, there are people who say that Sir Francis Bacon um, uh, discovered plate tectonics because he makes the, uh, he, he, he suggests that South America could fit into the gap where North America, you know, that the, the, the shapes are homologous and that therefore they might once have been one land mass. It's a long way from that to, um, to plate tectonics. That te tectonics. Oh, no, he didn't know. I... Exactly, yes. Yes, exactly. It's going down that track but not making the leap. I think that's right. <laughs> Mainly because he wasn't really concentrating on that. That was en passant, I think. Right. Should we take one more? Yes. 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 Basement. Yes, um, a zenith telescope is used really for one purpose, was used for one. So a zenith telescope w was used in the attempt to prove that, to prove that the Earth moves around the sun. Um, they believed that the fixed stars were much closer to us than they are. Um, they therefore believed you could ma measure parallax, a small displacement, if you lay on your back and took the precise location of a fixed star and then did it exactly six months later. Okay. Um, you can't actually do that, not even with it, because the, the, the fixed stars are too far away, so there isn't an angle of displacement. Um, but they tried, well, you have to try for I mean, the point is, a zenith telescope, people say, well, uh, they didn't think it was, but it was never used. But a zenith telescope is used rather occasionally, as, it, as it, it's used intermittently. Um, and, and I certainly do have evidence that Hooke did use it. Um, it doesn't use lenses. You don't need lenses, although you will use lenses in a micrometer eyepiece. Um, but uh, obviously, you know, I thought at one point that you had huge, great, you know, you had lenses at those levels, of the, but you don't. It's just a shaft. Um, and Hooke also tried with... Um, when he was, uh, you know, I said that when he, 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 they were exiled to Durden's, during, they went during the plague. He discovered a very deep well there, in fact, two very deep wells, and he tried doing experiments of the same kind from the bottom of these wells. <laughs> Nothing if not ingenious. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much indeed.